Well, ladies and gentlemen, today I've got a 10-time national champion, national wrestling champion, and a four-time national jiu-jitsu champion from New Zealand. His name is Clint Davies, but you might have heard of him because he's pretty famous because he's blind. So he's done all these things in the sighted divisions. He's not done this as a Paralympian or a, a para-athlete. He's done this in the sighted division. So I'm super stoked to welcome you to the podcast, Clint. And I just want to pick your brain about training and about, uh, you know, both just as a jiu-jitsu and a wrestling guy and then as a blind wrestling and jiu-jitsu guy, if that's okay. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you for having me. It's uh, really exciting to get to do this stuff. Um, I, I'm always surprised when I get to talk to people like you or get asked to do presentations, like I've done a few motivational speeches now, whatever, and I always find it surprising that people even want to hear my story because I just see myself as a regular person. <laughs> what do people want to hear about, typically? Like when you're brought to do some motivational speaking, you know, what is the, the typical, what's the stump speech about? Oh, they just want to know about my life, uh, how I got to where I am, because it's not terribly common, especially in New Zealand, for a blind athlete to be uh, doing what I'm doing, competing against able-bodied people, uh, especially in a contact sport like wrestling and then uh, recently jiu-jitsu. Uh, so they usually want to hear about that and hear about sort of the things that motivated me and a bit of my backstory, and yeah. Why don't we start with that backstory? I mean, were you uh, you were sighted originally, and I believe you lost your vision. Uh, yeah. So I was born with sight, and then when I was uh, just over two years old, uh, I had infected chickenpox, and the doctors prescribed me penicillin to help with that. And I had a major allergic reaction to the penicillin developing something called Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Uh, Stevens-Johnson syndrome basically is uh, blistering. And when I got it, I was the first person in New Zealand to get it full-bodied. Uh, I believe uh, one boy had had it on his arm and one uh, breastfeeding woman had had it on her breast. And then I got it full body. Um, <laughs> And I ended up in an intensive care unit uh, for three months. Uh, basically, they had to wash my skin down with a saline solution sort of every four hours. I know it's kind of um, the way it was described to me, because thank goodness I don't have too many memories of it. But um, of what I hear, it was like someone had held me by the feet and just held me in a, a pot of boiling water and. You know, I, I got major blistering all over the body. And the thing about it is it really likes to attack um, mucous membrane areas. So the eyes, nose, mouth, lungs. Um, <clears throat> and my blindness sort of is only one side effect of it. Um, I've got quite large scars in my lungs that when I get sick really fill up with fluid and stuff. So it's another um, mucous membrane, the lungs. Yeah, so... Um, my mouth and my saliva glands are damaged, so I pretty, uh, whenever I eat any sort of dry food or whatever, I've got to drink, uh, water and stuff because I've got a constant dry mouth, so, uh, so I went blind and, I mean, I, I was lucky, my mum was pretty strict on me, uh, you know, she, she always said, uh, Clinton, you know, the blind, uh, the world's not gonna, uh, exist around you around blindness, it's a sighted world, you've got to fit in, so she kind of, expected me to do everything uh, that sighted kids did, which is really awesome. Uh, you know, we had big chores lists when I was a kid, and I was expected to do stuff like that. Uh, my mum was a real neat freak, and for example, um, in the weekend when I was about, oh, I don't know, from about 12 up, she'd give us a room of the house each to clean, and that would include, like, vacuuming and clean all the walls, marks off the walls and things like that. And her friends would say to her, but he can't, he can't see the walls to be able to clean them, like he can't see the marks. And my mum would be like, well, he, he better work out how to do it in a pattern then to make sure he gets the whole wall, hadn't he? Because um, he's not getting off it because he was blind, uh, that sort of thing. 
uh, you know, so it was good. My mum was really tough on me. Uh, if I drag my feet along the ground, uh, you know, sometimes you see blind people and they sort of shuffle their feet. If I did that, my mum would just walk up the, behind me and slap my ears like, pick your feet up, boy, you know, so <laughs> it was really good. And she's really supportive about me uh, trying different sports and that. Like, I've tried all sorts of crazy things like... Um, uh, I tried playing soccer. That was really entertaining. Uh, the ball would go one way and I'd go running the other way. <laughs> um, I tried playing rugby, same sort of thing. Uh, I've always been into martial arts, so uh, I tried ninjutsu. Uh, <laughs> I laughed when I saw some of your videos about that because I was like, oh, man, I've been there and done that. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm going to get hate from the ninjutsu crowd, but I don't think there is another martial art that would serve as a better, like, insane person attractor you know i like you know if you wanted to have the if you run it open a school and have the biggest collection of you know weirdos come visit and this is saying as somebody who happily happily would have walked into a ninjutsu school but i i think there'd be nothing like a ninjutsu you know opening a purported ninjutsu school to immediately select all the people who uh you know you could indoctrinate or uh, turn into your little personal acolytes. So what was your ninjutsu school experience? Oh, it was actually pretty good. Um, the guy, you know, it wasn't too crazy, and we weren't doing too many uh, actual crazy ninja techniques. It was more uh, katas and stuff like that, so it wasn't as crazy as the stuff I've seen. But, uh, yeah, so I did a lot of uh, different things uh, growing up, trying stuff. And then when I was about... Uh, 17 we were living in a small town uh, and there wasn't really much to do there the two things that kids did there was play airsoft which I did actually do I got really good at shooting people by sound and <laughs> you're like uh, a yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I'm like one of the craziest blind people I, I know and I, I think it's sort of like one of my goals in, in life to be sort of known as um, the blind guy that just has no limits so yeah I, I played airsoft but my brother came to me one night I was reading a book and he he came to me and he said oh Clinton I found a wrestling gym and I thought he meant WWE wrestling and I was like oh man go away you know my brother was nine at the time and I was, uh, you know and he just kept no come on you, you're gonna like it come down and have a look and you know we had a big argument eventually my mum came out I was in a caravan at the time I have my own space and she was like oh just go down the road Clinton to keep them happy blah blah whatever and I went down and I did the first training and I fell in love with it and, and this was like a freestyle wrestling club uh, yeah, that, so that was freestyle wrestling and they did a little bit of Greco and so I did my first training and I loved it about six weeks later they had a tournament coming up and I was like sweet I'm gonna do that and I went to the tournament and I lost in like 40 seconds and I really enjoyed it and I said to them oh, I'm gonna be a national champion and everybody sort of looked at me like yeah okay whatever um, uh, for the next two years I lost 40 fights without uh, scoring a single point and the whole time I kept telling people oh, you know I'm I'm going to make it. I'll be a national champ. Okay, that that would be pretty discouraging to anybody to lose 40 times in a row without scoring a single point. So what kept you going there? I'm, I'm stubborn. Uh, when I tell people I'm going to do something, I just keep doing it until it happens. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the people ask me and they say, you know, especially now, they say, oh, it's inspirational what you've done and all of that. And, and I'm like, it's not inspirational. It's just stubbornness. I, I was just, I'm just stubborn. I'm a, me and my partner have this argument all the time. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm as stubborn as a rock and, you know, it, it's one of those things that it, it gets me into trouble sometimes even. But um, in this case, it was just, it was really good because it ended up getting to me, getting me where I wanted to. Uh, in 2005, I met this Japanese uh, coach. Uh, oh, well, because when I started wrestling, I was kind of like the blind guy that everybody let have a go. Like, and nobody believed me that I'd ever be able to make it anywhere or whatever. So in 2005, I met Koji. And he came and did a seminar at my gym. And like, I, I sort of had a, a rule of first on the mat, last off. So I always try to come to training early and start doing something. And then, you know, I'll be the last one asking questions or sparring longer than everybody else or whatever. And he really liked my attitude. And he said, oh, what's your goals of wrestling? And I told him I want to be a national champ. And he, um, 
and he was like, oh, you've got a lot to work on, uh, let, let's get on with it, and he had really bad English, and he, he said to me, I'll, I'll trade you English lessons for extra wrestling lessons, and I was like, okay, sweet, no problem, and we did that, and I slowly started winning uh, the occasional bronze medal, and then I started winning the occasional <coughs> silver medal, and then finally in 2007, I won my first national title and then I went on to do it 10 more times and and then I told everybody I was going to go to the world champs for wrestling which I'm not sure if people realize that's not quite as easy as it is for um, jiu-jitsu uh, you know you've got to go through qualification um, processes um, it's not just if, if anybody can go although I actually think that's a fair way of doing the world championships in some ways so did, <clears throat> but, did you uh, end up qualifying then? Uh, no, um, I think it's more fair, like, just allowing everyone to go, because then it's a true world championships, right? I mean, anybody can go and, you know, if you think you're the best in the world, you can go and put your money on the line or, you know, put it on the line and get to prove it whether you are or not. Um, you know, it takes politics out of it, which when selections and stuff come around, it, it, it politics come into it, um, which is a bit unfortunate. But so in... 2013, I qualified to go to the um, FELA World Cha It was FELA then, now it's United World Wrestling. Qualified to go to the um, FELA World Champs. It was the year um, Jordan Burroughs uh, won his title uh, just after having his ankle surgery. I was actually in Jordan Burroughs' weight, and uh, interesting story about that in a second. But anyway, so I went there. I was the first blind person to fight at the Wrestling World Championships. I was the first New Zealander to do Greco-Roman at the World Championships and I was the first New Zealander to do both freestyle and Greco-Roman at, at a World Championships at the same time. So so, so you'd qualified for both Greco and freestyle? Yeah, I okay. did. That's amazing. So it's pretty cool. And then, so anyway, I, you know, I sort of did that uh, multiple time Oceania champ, whatever, and sort of bringing the story, speeding it up just because we've got limited time. Uh, I also coach wrestling. That's one of the weirdest things. I, to be honest, I don't know. People say, oh, how do you do that when you're blind? I don't know. I mean, well, I do know, but, you know, I, I let people do technique on me and stuff so that I can feel how it's going in that. But, you know, I run full classes and I've had um, numerous national champs out of my gym. I've had Oceania champs that I've trained. Uh, two of my kids have been to the Youth Olympics in 2014. I've had a Commonwealth Games athlete and I've had an Olympic athlete out of my gym. So uh, reasonably successful coaching as well. But uh, the reason I changed to Jiu-Jitsu was because uh, I had young kids that I've been coaching since they're about eight years old and they started coming up into my age and weight divisions and I didn't really want to be competing against um, kids that I've been coaching for that long and uh, people that I was coaching in my gym because I felt like it was a conflict of interest. Uh, so yeah. Te teach them all wrong so that you can kick their ass on the mat. I think that would be the obvious solution. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> so then you made the jump to jiu-jitsu and how, yeah. was, how was that jump? How has that changed? What, what did you have to adapt? I mean, other than the gi, which everyone has to struggle with. Yeah, so the hardest thing is um, changing over from... I mean, by the time I went to jiu-jitsu, it was good because, you know, I already had credentials and stuff. So when I went in there, everybody took me seriously. Like, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't just a blind guy coming to give jiu-jitsu a go. And so everybody knew who I was by then, in New Zealand anyway, and... Um, so it was good. The, uh, and my team, I train uh, under Pedro Fernandez at um, Tukaha Jiu-Jitsu in New Zealand. And um, <clears throat> Pedro's an awesome guy. He's a Brazilian dude. He's a fourth degree black belt. And he, you know, he's just really welcoming. And, you know, he just put me in the class and treated me like everybody else. Uh, I spent uh, nine months as a white belt. <laughs> I never, I've never been allowed to compete at white belt. I've always had to compete at blue belt because of um, the rules that say if you're a high level wrestler, you have to compete at. Which is blue fair, belt. I think. <laughs> um, yeah, in some ways, it's it's interesting. In nogi wrestling is uh, quite a big 
advantage, but I found that, especially because people knew me in the gi, I never got a chance to wrestle. People would come out, get their grips, and bang, pulled, pulled out. You know, like they just there, there was no wrestling for me in jiu-jitsu uh, for quite a while. And then with the gi on, you know, it's a completely uh, different game. But what did I have to change? The, the biggest thing for me, actually, was uh, learning not to give up my back and to go on my back. Yes. Uh, it was kind of funny. Uh, after six weeks, uh, Pedro puts two stripes on my belt, and he says, Go away, Clinton, and every time I look at you, I want to see you on your back. And when I give you your, your blue belt, you'll know that I'm happy with what you're doing with your guard. <laughs> <laughs> so I went away and spent uh, three months in absolute misery with people on top of me uh, beating me up because I was on my back, and I just had no idea what to do. <laughs> well, so let's just – I realized – there's a burning question in my mind, and I'm sure it's a burning question in the minds of the people who are listening. So when you're doing freestyle, you don't start touching. You start distance apart. So what's to stop the guy from just coming in super low with a low single or something? Or how do you actually get grips on the guy? Because I'm assuming that most of your game starts once you've got hands on the other guy. Yeah, that's right. So, um, I'm classified as totally blind, but I can kind of see shadows. So, the, I mean, my reaction times are always slower when guys are at distance, but it, um, I could always kind of make out where they were. Like, uh, once a person's like, well, even if I'm like right up close to a person, I can't see any facial detail or anything like that. But once they get, you know, once they're about a meter away or anything, people just become blobs to me. I can't make out hands or arms or legs or anything like that. So, yes, um, when I started wrestling here, they actually they actually started me in contact. They started um, hands on top of each other, one up, one down. And then when I went to my first Oceania Champs, uh, they said to me, oh, no, this is international wrestling. We, we don't do that. Uh, you either adapt or <laughs> bad luck. And unfortunately for me, I'd only had, they only told me 30 minutes before I competed that that was going to be the case. So it made a big difference at that competition. But then I came back to New Zealand and I just sort of came up with strategies of how to deal with that. Luckily, um, in freestyle, the distance that they start... Um, start about is not as big as the distance in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu so it was a little bit easier to um, uh, to catch it and and with the whole low single legs thing and that I, I got very good at because um, sprawling from uh, long distance shots is difficult so I got very good at uh, counter throwing and things like that once somebody got onto my leg and that is why I prefer Greco because it made that sort of thing a lot easier not to have to deal with that <laughs> I remember seeing a, a blind guy compete in a judo tournament, and I don't know if it was a regional thing or if it was a national thing or if it was an international thing, but they would everything would be the same except he would start with grips, right? You would start with the, the lapel and sleeve grip. Like I said, that was years ago. I don't know if it's changed since then, but they, they did kind of make a concession for him, but that was the only concession that they made. Or well, in Paralympic judo, that is how they start. No, no, uh, he was know, competing they... in the uh, in the regular divisions, so they would make that adjustment for him in the regular divisions. Okay, so I'm wondering. Um, actually, the first time I came over to the um, Adult Worlds for um, Jiu Jitsu last year, yeah, last year, 2016, uh, the guy actually, the referee asked me if I wanted to start with grips, and I told him no. Now, the reason I say no to that is because, uh, one, because of my wrestling, I I've had to do it without um, grips my whole wrestling career, uh, well, since that first Oceanias. And second of all, I, I don't like the idea of uh, the fact that, you know, so this guy, he's trained all, all, all the way up to go to the world champs. He's got his game plan or whatever, and his game plan might not, uh, be, a, be okay I've got grips to start with you know he I don't know his thing might be really far away low single legs to get in or whatever like you were talking about 
and suddenly, you know, this blind guy comes out, he draws this blind guy in the draw, but he doesn't even know he's entering the world champs, and the referee asks me right on the sideline, oh, do you want to start with grips? He doesn't even get asked about it, and then we go out in the middle, and he gets told, oh, by the way, this guy's going to get to start with grips on you, um, surprise, so, you know, in some ways, I think that's a bit unfair to my, um, opponents so i just said to the referee no it's okay i'm used to dealing without so it's fine <laughs> uh you know and and the way i see it is i've always wanted to compete against able-bodied athletes i've always wanted to be like i mean i could have gone down the paralympic judo road when i you know at, but i've always just wanted to compete against able-bodied athletes so the way i see it it's my job to adapt uh, and find ways around stuff not for people to give me um uh, differences or to alter the game to suit my blindness so there's the stubbornness again yeah pretty much the the only the only thing that i would um that i would ask in fact i'd prefer to have this than start with grips um is because of the no coaching rule in bjj and uh, at the world, it's not too bad because, uh, you know, a coach can stand right by the fence or whatever. But here in New Zealand, where we run our tournaments, uh, the, the athletes are downstairs and the coaches are upstairs. Uh, the only thing that I would ask for, and it, the only reason I say that I would accept it is because it wouldn't disadvantage the other guy anyway, would be as the ref awarded points and stuff to call them out because that is a huge disadvantage. When you're on the mat and you can't see what the score and the time is, that is stressful, especially when, it, especially when uh, advantages are involved and advantages are quite subjective. Sometimes you get them, sometimes you don't. <laughs> mm. yeah. I was just about to say, talking about the you know defending the low single and pulling guard, I don't know if you heard about it, but uh, a friend of mine was competing, Mark, uh, Brandon Mullins was competing, and he really likes the low single, and this was in jiu-jitsu, and he shot the low single just as the other guy was doing a flying close guard pull. Oh, out! Shooting directly underneath him, <laughs> and so basically, uh, one guy does. It's almost like I don't know a vault, and the other guy does a, a low dive, and they end up facing opposite ways. Uh, so, so the guy didn't land on top of him. No, no, they completely jumped. It was like a choreographed Cirque du Soleil moment. Uh, it, it's it was very funny. Uh, I'm surprised that hasn't uh, got more uh, more noticed on Facebook. <laughs> I'll I'll look for it. I saw it on YouTube, I believe. Uh, I'll uh, I'll look for it and and send you the link. But the uh, so I'm assuming that once things hit the ground, I mean I've regularly rolled with my eyes shut, and so long as there's some contact there, it's not too different. So I mean I guess you can't compare it to the sighted experience, but do you feel yourself at any you feel yourself at any disadvantage once, other than the the points thing? Yeah, well, as it, well, yeah, as you said, I and you know, I, I like the fact that you realize that because a lot of people, one of the questions I get is, um, Clinton, what can you see? And I turn around and I say to them, well, what can you see? And they say everything. And I'm like, what's everything? And they're like, everything. And I'm like, well, describe everything to me because I have no idea what everything means. And, um, you know, people are like, oh, I can't. I'm like, well, <laughs> exactly. I can't really describe to you what I can see because I, I don't know what I'm comparing it to. So ask me, can, can you see this or can you see that? Because um, I, I can't... Uh, I can't confirm this, but the way medical people described it to my mum, uh, my vision, is if you take uh, bubble wrap, you know, the stuff that they put into um, uh, parcels and stuff, and then you wrap four layers of that and look through it, apparently that's about what my vision's like. So, um, so people have tried that and they say it's not that great. Haven't you uh, had people, this, though, uh, say that you have an advantage? Didn't you just have a debate with some guy saying, arguing that you had an advantage? Oh, no, no. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no. Okay, so that guy. No, so uh, he put, and it happened quite a lot. Um, a video of mine, it's probably my only viral video. Uh, I, I was in a competition. Uh, it was an in-house competition. And uh, my, my favorite wrestling technique when I wrestled was uh, the fireman's or kata groomer. And... Uh, I did, I did it, I put it up as a throwaway clip on Instagram, and, um, 
um, one of the big grappling websites got it and it ended up with like 7,000 shares, nearly a million views. And then uh, I just put up a wrestling technique on Friday onto YouTube that um, I believe can be used as a uh, jujitsu submission. It's called the West Point. And yes, I've seen that. That's, uh, you teach it well, by the way. Ah, uh, thank you. So, uh, and and I mean, I put a disclaimer at the start. I said, you know, I you know, I've tapped guys in sparring with it, but I haven't used it at a competition yet. So, uh, I, and I, you know, I'd like to, but I believe I could tap someone at a jujitsu comp. And I said, be careful if you try it at the gym because I've hurt a lot of people with it. Um, and when I mean hurt, I mean I've broken like nine people's ribs with it. So, <laughs> yeah, it's quite strong grip. But anyway. When I put up the um, fire, well, when the video of the firemen went viral, a lot of people said, oh, you know, it's not that hard rolling with your eyes closed, and oh, we do that in the gym all the time. And then in the instructional video, a guy uh, said it as well, and it was uh, kind of just one comment. And I sort of, you know, I wasn't really irritated, but I went on there and I said to him, you know, look, uh, I, I don't mean to be picking a fight or whatever with you because I agree with you that rolling uh, with your eyes closed is not that hard. But, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a blind guy that's competed at three world championships now for jiu-jitsu and, you know, I'm a four-time national champion, whatever. But, so, so I agree with you, but it's not the rolling that's difficult being blind. And I said to him, I, how about you put a blindfold on and go and do the entire class blindfolded and then come back and tell me how easy it is to do this blind. Because it's, it's not the rolling that's hard. It's the learning technique. Now, my coaches are good. Um, every class that I'm at, I'm the demonstration dummy and they demonstrate the technique on me so that I can feel what's going on. They used to just uh, show the technique and then uh, uh, they'd come and show it to me once, but they worked out that if they use me as the dummy, then I can feel it three or four times in a row and um, I, I can also feel what they're talking about with the smaller details and the techniques and things like that. But, you know, for somebody who doesn't learn like that by having it done on you, uh, I don't think a lot of people would find that easy to learn like that straight away. Like put a blindfold on and then, okay, this is how you do, do the technique, walk them through it. And then, you know, okay, go away and start drilling that technique now. Um, I th um, a lot of brown and black belts, I think, would be fine with it. But I think a lot of blue and purple belts and, and definitely white belts, they'd just be like, what are we doing? <laughs> well, so many people are visual learners, and I'm guessing that you're a strong kinesthetic learner at this point yeah well that's the only way I can do it I, I mean you know I, I can't see even like half a meter away I can't see any detail so I can't see what's going on and <clears throat> so those are the other disadvantages like you know other people when they're not sparring they can sit and watch everybody else sparring and they might see a technique that they like or an escape that they like or you know they, they can find answers to their questions by just observing and uh, whatever they can go go and watch competition matches and oh well that that's the way guys do this in competition or or even like going and watching um video of people that they may have to compete against uh you know <coughs> and these are all sorts of things that i can't do and then the other thing that uh i like to argue with people because yeah, um i have a few people and People ask me, do I have any regrets about being blind? And when I was younger, you know, I, I didn't like being blind or whatever. But now, the only two major regrets that I have about being blind, um, my biggest regret, I have two children, a 14-year-old and a 10-year-old. Um, my biggest regret being blind is that I missed their first smiles. That was really heartbreaking for me. And I didn't, you know, I really didn't appreciate that. And it really hurt. And the other thing that I regret is that I can't drive. And people like, you know, people, some people say to me, oh, driving is not that big a deal, Clinton. I'm like, yeah, it's not that big a deal because you have a choice. Like, <laughs> um, you know, tell me when it's hailing and stormy, windy outside and I'm getting ready for a competition uh, and I've got to go to training and I've got to get into my gear, go down and catch the bus and then you know I get to the gym and I've got wet gear on and I get into my gear and I train and then I put wet cold gear back on to go back home and then you know that'll be at lunchtime training and then I've got to come and do it all again in the evening you know 
Like those, those sorts of things uh, where it starts sucking, being blind and being an athlete. And <laughs> How many times a day do you train? Oh, is, it, is twice a day training pretty normal for you? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, twice a day training. Uh, and usually I do some sort of, um, some sort of coaching as well. Uh, I teach, I teach, uh, kids jujitsu and kids wrestling. And I also teach a adult wrestling class as well. Where do you teach just so people who are in New Zealand can find you? Uh, so my kids jujitsu class is at club physical in, in Auckland and, um, uh, my wrestling class is over there as well. And I also take the uh, wrestling, uh, we have a wrestling class once a week out at Tukaha Jiu Jitsu, which I take oh, as very well. Cool. Uh, how, how strong are you objectively compared to most people, <laughs> your weight? Um, because of wrestling, I did a lot of strength and conditioning when wrestling, a lot of weightlifting and stuff. I don't do as much of that now that I do um, jiu-jitsu. I, I find that it, it takes away from my flexibility. But um, I, I'm definitely in the stronger end. I, I find that uh, wrestlers are overall more powerful than jiu-jitsu players. Uh, jiu-jitsu players can be a bit more bendy and uh, they can move in different planes of motion to wrestlers but definitely power wise I'm pretty strong um, my my deadlifts up around um, 190 kilo and that's with training twice a day and you know I'm not a power lifter but um, after doing a twice a day training session the day before I can get up to a one RM of about 100 and 180, nearly 100, well, 188 is actually my best deadlift ever. And how much do you weigh? Um, and I weigh 73 kilos. So more I'm than quite, twice I'm body weight big, deadlift. Uh, quite a bit more than twice my body weight, yeah. So that's, that, that's impressive. I mean, unless you're trying to break the world powerlifting record, um, yeah, that's bloody strong. Yeah, and I mean, it, it helps in jiu-jitsu. I mean, when I'm training, I try not to roll with power because I find it slows me down. Um, and especially, uh, it's funny, people ask me, do you like, you know, oh, you must prefer, well, they don't ask me, actually, they tell me, oh, you must prefer uh, no gi over gi because of all your wrestling. Uh, well, actually, I enjoy gi more at the moment because it's it's different to what I've done, you know, and I love the intricacies. I, I love using lapels to choke people and be tricky with them and um, <clears throat> because it's different and it's interesting and I, I love learning new skills, so... Um, you know, learning to hold someone down in side control in nogi, it's not too much different, or or even the mount or whatever, it's not too much different to what I've done in wrestling. Whereas pulling someone's gi lapel out and wrapping it around their neck and <laughs> using that to strangle them, that that's entertaining to me. You know, <laughs> the things that grapplers do to entertain themselves. Try explaining that to oh, a yeah, normal right. person. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I sometimes. When people ask what I do or what my website's about, I tell them male pajama wrestling, and they almost <laughs> always get the wrong idea. It's very strange. Yeah, I can imagine. It's the same as, uh, uh, you know, people, what do you have to do to, this afternoon? Struggle cuddles with my male friends. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, they slowly they back the out of the room. Like yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's quite funny. So what was uh, traveling like? I mean, both the World Championships or just uh, traveling in general? Uh, traveling is uh, fun for me as a blind person. I've been to a few interesting places. Um, the most interesting for me as a blind person and scary was India. Uh, you went, I went to India? India? Did you, yes. Did you have I somebody with you or India. did you go to India alone? Uh, no, no, luckily, <laughs> luckily I was with a team. Um, I didn't start traveling by myself until I started doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu when, uh, we didn't have, uh, you know, set national teams or whatever. Uh, so, uh, yeah, India was really entertaining. I went there in 2009 for the Commonwealth Wrestling Champs. <laughs> it was in, um, Jalandhar, which is like just on the Pakistan border. <laughs> And India is a really scary place for blind people. First of all, uh, the driving in India is absolutely insane. And doing that blindfolded in a car when your teammates going, whoa, that person nearly hit us like front on is really intimidating. Um, 
Yeah. Not that being able to see would help you at all, but maybe it gives you the illusion of, you know, at least like a brace or something. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it was kind of, and, you know, they go, oh, Clinton, we're, we're on a road that has three lanes in each direction, but really there are 12 lanes of traffic, and I'm going, oh my gosh, like, <laughs> am I going to survive this? Um, and we were walking down the road, I was with the national team coach, and um, he grabs me, and he yanks me out of the way real real sudden, and just like pulls me, and he goes, oh my gosh, you, you know, you nearly got your head cut off, there was like a lorry coming down the road, and it had this big piece of sheet iron um, off the side, and it was just, <laughs> uh, so, you know, things like that, um, we couldn't see it. Uh, we that also wouldn't, got that wouldn't make much of a tombstone, he died doing what he loved doing which was walking down the road in india yeah no that that would be sad um <laughs> uh, i almost uh, well uh, we also got um a gun pointed at us which is uh, we were walking down the road trying to find some scales to check our weight they were like oh there's a vegetable salad that has some scales it was a really interesting place uh india uh, anyway, we're trying to walk down this alleyway to try and find it. Uh, me, the national team coach, and another guy, and the security guard that was with us. Because at the time, they were going through all that terror stuff. So we had um, guys with automatic rifles with us everywhere we went and stuff on the buses and that. And uh, we're walking down the alleyway, and the guard starts yelling at us, No, don't go that way. And we're like, Oh, we're just going to check the scale, and then we'll be back. And he's like, No, don't go that way. And... Um, and suddenly the national team coach has gra grabbed me and he's like, don't move, Clinton. Uh, why? Uh, he's pointing his rifle at us. Uh, Come back this way. And he's like, Hang don't on. The security move. guard was pointing the rifle at you or some other dude? No, the security guard was, yeah. Good Lord. It was, he's there to protect yeah. you? Yeah. And then um, we India was really, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we were at the venue and... Um, We'd all just wait in, and we're waiting for a bus to uh, take us back, and we're all kind of bored, and there are a few guys with um, the assault rifles standing around, and one of the guys is like, oh, I wonder if they'll let us take a photo with it, and, um, oh my gosh, and so he walks up to the security guard, and he's like, oh, can, can we take a photo holding your gun, and he's like, no, no, you can't, you can't do that. And he was like, oh, what about if we all give you 100 rupees each? Oh, here, yeah, you hold my gun. <laughs> 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 so they're passing the gun around. Of course, I wanted a photo with it. So um, they hand the gun to me. And uh, they didn't know, but when I was younger, I lived on a farm. So I, I'd actually had a bit of uh, experience with um, firearms and stuff. They hand it to me. And I, it could, you know, it's uh, I think it was an LSR. And they hand it to me, and I grab the handle, and you know, and, and they're like, "No, don't put your finger near the trigger, Clinton!" Like they're all freaking out. So, quite is that on your Instagram by any chance? Oh, no, that was before I started doing oh. social media. Oh, um, you need to I wish go and put that photo. That'd be a fantastic photo. I think I, I think I do have. Um, somebody will have the photo somewhere. I'm, I should actually get that and see if I can uh, put it up. Yeah, put it up on your for your Throwback Thursday. Yeah, exactly. You throw and, down Thursday. Um, and then the other really cool thing that happened is so. Um, Fire on Friday. My iPod, got, my iPod got stolen. We went to a police station to um, report it because I wanted a document for my travel insurance so that I could um, claim one. And stuff. That was an interesting story in all in itself. But as we're coming back, we're on the bus. It was just me and my teammate and um, the drive. And my teammate goes, Oh my gosh, Clinton, there's an elephant walking down the road. And I'm like, Because these guys play blind jokes on me all the time um and i was like nah whatever man and he's like no no seriously there's an elephant across there walking down the road in the traffic and he gets the bus driver to stop and he's like come here then i'll show you and we jump off the bus and we go across the road and sure enough there's this big elephant walking down all this crazy traffic it was yeah it was an awesome experience but um so you got to lay I hands on the elephant yeah, I got the pattern, and they were like, uh, he, he asked us if we wanted to have a ride and stuff, but we needed to get back to the venue and that, so unfortunately we didn't do that, because that would have been really cool. Um, well, speaking of traveling, I know you got to go, and I know I got to go. Um, I hope this isn't the last time we talk, and I hope that at some point we can actually meet up and train. I mean, we're, you know, there's only, uh, what's half the circumference of the world? I don't know, many, many thousands of uh, miles, but, you know, there are airplanes. 
Uh, I do. Well, I've made it over to uh, the US three times in the last uh, two years, so Canada can't be too much further from the US, so I have to try and... Uh, just walk north a bit. <laughs> just walk north a bit. It, it'll take you like uh, a year to find me. Yeah, and something then, like that. But... If, and that's if I don't get lost or whatever. Although, um, luckily for me, with the uh, age of technology... Um, I have, uh, like, my I- iPhone talks to me and stuff, and I use the maps on there to get around quite a lot. Well, had That's an, actually I, had, I had an internet friend uh, contact me and say, hey, I'm going to be in Montreal, uh, Montreal, Canada, you know, next week. I'd love to meet up and roll and, and grab dinner. And I was like, yeah, I'm only about 3,000 miles from there, but, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so it's a big place. Yeah, it's hilarious when uh, we talk about, like, well, when we hear people talk about that, or even when I came to the US and, you know, I live in tiny old New Zealand, which is four and a half million people, and, you know, we, we can't get to another country, uh, you know, by land. We have to fly uh, to Australia, which is the closest, and then anywhere else is just a mission to get to. So, yeah, it's always interesting when you go to another country, and you're like, wow, I'm in a country that, you know, there's other countries touching it. <laughs> So just before we go, Clinton, how can people sort of keep track of you, get in touch with you? Like, what are the best modalities for doing that? Uh, so I have an athletes page on Facebook, um, Blind Grappler. Uh, I'm on Instagram also as Blind Grappler. And I'm just starting to try to build up my YouTube channel now, which is under Clinton mm-hmm. Davies, which I should probably change to Blind Grappler as well, just so that it's all the same. But... Uh, Clinton Davies at the moment. There's some of my fights uh, up on there at the moment. I'm just in the process of loading up all the ones from uh, the Nationals from this year, and I'll put up the ones from the World Champs this year because uh, I was lucky enough to um, place in the top 16 at the Masters Worlds this year. Uh, so that was that was really cool. So, uh, yeah, if everybody uh, goes along and likes my athletes page and uh, follows me on Instagram, that would be uh, fantastic. Um uh, hopefully I'll get more sponsorship and stuff because the more sponsorship I get, uh, the more I get to go and compete and uh, do these crazy things and inspire people. Uh, I- I've got a few crazy things in, in mind uh, to keep keep doing crazy things. Um, after watching uh, the EBI with the combat jiu-jitsu, I am kind of looking into uh, whether that's going to be a possibility because I think that would probably, if I can do a combat jiu-jitsu fight, that would probably uh, cement me in history as maybe the craziest um, <laughs> blind, uh, blind grappling athlete ever, which I-, I wouldn't mind that title, no, to be honest. No, you might as- if you're going to have a title, it might as well be a good one. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. <laughs> so. Well, thank you so much, and we'll stay in touch for sure. Ah, uh, thank you so much, and I hope we get to train together sometime soon. <laughs> That'd be great. Podcast listeners, if you're listening, there's a good chance that you're into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I hope that you are. It's the best martial art out there. But nevertheless, if you do Jiu-Jitsu, if you do grappling, if you do MMA, I've got a book out there. It's called A Roadmap to BJJ, and it covers the fundamentals of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, It covers the techniques and the positions. It's got checklists. It's a super useful resource, and it's completely free. If you go to grapplearts.com forward slash book, you can download it. It's also on Amazon Kindle where you can buy it if you want to go that way, but I'm going to suggest the free route, which is grapplearts.com slash book. Check it out. I get feedback almost every day from people who found this super useful in finally getting through and understanding the ground game and it finally making sense for them and it finally not being so intimidating anymore. Check it out. I think you'll find it really useful too.